Ε, θα παρουσιάσουμε ένα περιστατικό από το Ιπποκράτιο. Ζητώ συγγνώμη εκ μέρου του καθηγητή κ. Τσιούφη λόγω υποχρέωση εκτό Ελλάδο δεν μπορούσε να είναι παρόν. Θα ήθελα να μιλήσω στην Αγγλία. Ναι, ναι, ναι. Θα ήθελα να μιλήσω στην Αγγλία. 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 Θα ήθελα And he has scored three to four. She was hemodynamically unstable, and she was in constant need of phenotropes at quite high doses in order to maintain uh, blood pressure. Uh, her background uh, included surgical aortic valve replacement in 2011, an epic supra 19 mm valve. She had a permanent pacemaker implanted. She was also diabetic and hypertensive. She was on maximal um, medical treatment and uh, high doses of diuretics as well. This is her ECG, sinus rhythm. We see the block also from the pacemaker. And uh, now we can see uh, the first images when she came to our hospital, except uh, for uh, the aortic valve that had uh, the major problem. We also can see that there was a quite severe mitral regurgitation as well, dilatation of uh, both atria, And uh, here we can see that there is a, a dysfunction of the aortic valve that was implanted 13 years ago, actually. Her ejection fraction was approximately 45%. And as we can see here, uh, the mean gradient was approximately 23 millimeters mercury. And uh, the, the aortic valve, uh, the max, was 3.5 uh, meter an, uh, per second. So, We are talking about the low flow low gradient severe aortic uh, stenosis. And, uh, and uh, as we can see here also, she had uh, at least moderate ma tricuspid regurgitation as well. Uh, concerning our patient, we can uh, see here that uh, we are talking about a lady who had uh, the first uh, valve implanted 13 years ago. And now she is 80 years old, as we can see here at the diagram. There is a degeneration of the valve, there is a failure of the valve. We can see that um, the durability of the uh, valves implanted, either transcatheter valves or surgically implanted by prosthetic valves, have a durability approximately of 10 years, and there, there is a dysfunction of the valves. Uh, we can see that um, by these diagrams that uh, the gradient is a bit uh, more in case of a TAVI and a bit less in case of a surgical implanted valve. And as far as the outcomes of uh, a valve involved in case we need because of the patients are uh, nowadays having their first implantation at a lower age, so they might need the second valve as well. We can see that approximately the percentages are the same in case of, of a TAVIN TAVI or a TAVIN surgical implanted valve. Uh, the numbers speak by themselves, I think. As the population get, is getting older and older, more and more patients are in need of a, a valve uh, implantation of the aortic valve. And uh, comparing the surgical and the transcatheter implanted valve, we can see that uh, the surgical is better in case of uh, coronary obstruction if we need to do is worse, I'm sorry, it was not better, if we need to do a TAVIN in SAVR instead of a TAVIN TAVI. So, sorry for interrupting yes. you. So the aim of this uh, TAVI round is to, ha yes, to yes, yes. have an interactive discussion. So uh, before we move to how you deal with this case, mm -hmm. uh, can you prescribe for, for us how, uh, what is the properties of this uh, epic valve, this uh, yes. degenerated bioprocesses? It's, it's, uh, it's ex uh, yes, uh, the, the diagram uh, I also think is extended uh, with external mounted leaflets valve, yes. I'm going to show also the characteristics of the valve later on. Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, the ages are over nine because the mean age of the valve, the prosthetic valve, uh, life expectancy is approximately 10 years. The lady is over 10 years as we already saw. And just uh, in order to say before I answer your question, of course, is that um, in, uh, in the case of the lady, we uh, concluded that it was a structural 
the, the reason for the dysfunction of the bioprosthetic valve. And I'm going to show the characteristics as well. We had a hard team, as uh, we already said, because it's a lady that not only had her aortic valve uh, dysfunction, there was also severe mitral regurgitation and a moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation as well. And the lady was uh, in need of inotropes all the time she was uh, hospitalized. So depending on uh, the guidelines and based on them, we know that the transfermal approach of a valve valve procedure has a 2A recommendation. Uh, and even if it's not the aortic valve, we can see also that the mitral tricuspid is a 2B recommendation. This is the Euroscore 2 of the lady. It's quite high, as we can see, and the STS score as well. And uh, the lady had a coronary angiography, actually, two months ago. She was, uh, the coronaries were fine, not a problem, fortunately, by there. And the main problem of the aortic valve, except for the stenosis, was as well the uh, aortic regurgitation, as we can see here by the autography of the patient. So, uh, as far as the valve selection, as you already mentioned, and thank you very much, uh, we all use the app that we know that nowadays is used, and we see that we have quite a few options, but uh, some of them are used with caution. So, depending on the data we had and the fact that the lady could not have a CT as it should be performed because she was an inotropy dependent and she couldn't be easily moved to another uh, facility or to do the CT, we can see, I'm going to come back just to say that the valve used, the Epic Supra is a stand post, the leaflets valve. Uh, it's, uh, um, not bovine, uh, the, the precardium used. It was 19 millimeters, and it's a valve that can't be fractured as well. It's good to know, of course, that before we decide what to do. So, uh, depending on the algorithm used, we decided to have uh, the second valve, I mean, that uh, was uh, uh, implanted, was a 23 millimeter Evolute R. Uh, we had in mind that we may, might need it to fracture the valve depending on the hemodynamic status of the lady. Okay, Here thank you. <laughs> so we have a lady of 20, uh, 81 year old with a failed bioprocesses, yes. extended, internally mounted valve yes. uh, with uh, stenosis and bifurcation. Yes. Uh, any thoughts about the coronary protection, protection of the coronaries in this uh, case? Yes, any of course. Any thoughts about, of course, this lady has already a pacemaker, no. No problem, no problem uh, concerning AV. Uh, what about the coronary protection? Any thoughts about that? Yes, of course. It was always in mind that we had in mind that we might need uh, to use uh, uh, the basilica and the chimney technique are the most used ones, of course. But uh, uh, we had also the chance to do, uh, I just don't have the, the, the image, to do a, not a full study of a TOE and also to measure from the CD that we had was not for the preparation of the TAVIS. We had the CD just to know if there was any other problems because some there was also some uh, markers uh, uh, of uh, in inflammation increase and we thought that maybe there was also the endocarditis, the reason that had a role for her dysfunction of the valve, but uh, nothing was... Uh, uh, we could not the VTC of this case, it was good enough in order yes. to... Yes, yes, yes. And uh, also the coronary ostal was above uh, 12 millimeters. That's uh, it's also the sinotubular junction. Uh, there was quite enough gap, so uh, we were okay. And we also did quite a few times. The reason why we did not also decide to do so was because she was quite uh, frail, the lady. That was also the reason why we used the transradial approach for the second approach, uh, while most of the times we use both, both femoral arteries. In valve cases or in all cases, do you use uh, the radial axis? What is your strategy? What is your policy? Yes, most of the times, uh, if the radial axis and the patient has uh, the, the body structure that allows us to do, because most of the times we use uh, left radial axis, we use the radial. But if there is a problem, yes, 
in Any thoughts about surgery in this case? Is it a surgical candidate or do we go straight forward to TAVI? No, no thoughts about surgery. Given, given the age of the patient and the fact that the coronaries are normal, so we're really concerned, we're not really concerned with reaccessing in the future for coronary artery disease the coronary circulation, just avoiding obstructing the coronary circulation, I would proceed with uh, yes. TAVR. Our, okay. our valve and valve. What Dr. Gradion has done in this case, would you protect the coronaries with a wire, at least a wire, or no need for that? I don't see any need for that. There is adequate uh, height. Okay. Uh, there is a wide sinotubular rejection. That's yes. what I'm talking about. To, to be honest, at the heart team, uh, the cardiac surgeon, because in our hospitals there, are cardiac, uh, there is a cardiac uh, surgery unit and clinic, uh, it was debatable, but the risk was too high, and also the anesthesiologist said that she won't make it through surgery. Any comments from the audience? No. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Were you preparing for a frac just in case? I know it's an older person, probably not that big, but um, and then were your measurements in CT big enough considering that you might have to frac, even with the self-expansion? So in this case, Dr. Valiano, would you think that a pre-dilatation is better or a post-dilatation is safer? I think po I like to post-dilate, and in this case, especially with a bioprosthetic valve that's already leaking a lot, I'd worry about uh, pre-dilating and then the patient crashing. So. Thank you yes. for your comment. Thank we you. did the, the exact uh, same thing. Uh, we post dilated the valve, as just like. Mm -hmm. So you did a pre dilatation. A pro, uh, this post is the post dilatation. Yes, okay. yes. All right, yes. This the, is the, the Evolute Pro 23 millimeter yes, valve. Yes. Okay. And the post dilatation with an 18 millimeter valve. Yes. Balloon. And this is the autography post the post dilatation <laughs> of the valve, which is, was quite convenient for us, uh, depending on the patient and her background. Uh, the femoral artery was okay. Uh, we used a Manta 14 French in order to seal the artery. And is this the Manta the main uh, uh, device you use for closure? Or what uh, is your strategy yes. for Gradient Hospital? In most of the cases, yes. But uh, we also may use Proglide. But in most of the cases, nowadays at least, yes, it's the Manta. Thank 18 you. or 14 millimeters. And uh, after uh, our procedure, the patient was hemodynamically stable. Uh, I suppose course. it was a case with a conscious sedation, no transesophageal echo. No. With, you don't use transesophageal echo at all? Uh, we might use it. No, it's not everyday practice to use it, even in valve in valve patients who, who are riskier patients most of the times. Uh, but if needed, yes. We don't have uh, much experience on. I see, for instance, no. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, uh, just. Uh, yes, there is a close. comment from the audience. Of course, of course. Go ahead. With Professor Chuvis, I'm uh, Assistant Professor Dimitriadis. We have done this case. Actually, this is one of the cases of urgent TAVI. I think this is something that's growing also in the publication. And I think uh, if we haven't done this, this uh, operation, the patient will definitely gonna uh, end. And uh, so we, we did our minimalistic approach. We tried to do the radial approach. We just do an, auto, uh, an orthography. And uh, based on the results, we can say we were a little bit lucky because sometimes you would want to be lucky in such kinds of situations. We haven't cracked the valve. We were not so sure about doing this, so uh, we have done, as you see, the platation and afterwards the post dilatation, and the results were just fine. And what we have seen, and also Irini Gunasovas, is after the position of the valve, the patient really get well with conscious sedation. That's what we do in uh, Hippocration in all the in all the in all the cases, and uh, then also the MR and the TR really uh, ameliorated. This is something that we see, but you're not Sorry. quite sure. And actually, there was a heart team that was done five continuous days. The patient was in the ward, then it went down to the intensive care unit with inotropes. Nobody will try to touch her. And then we said, it was Wednesday morning, okay, let's do, 
let's proceed because there was no other choice. And I think all in the audience, you're very experienced operators, you have uh, cases like that, and this is one of the, one of the, of the cases that we really are happy to, to, that we have proceeded. So it's our yeah. experience too that when we have uh, severe regurgitation, the improvement of the patient is, is uh, impressive, and uh, these patients are improving uh, more impressively. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the amelioration of the clinical status of the patient was really something that we were not really expected afterwards, just after, after the case. Is there any specific reason you choose uh, the self-expanding valve instead of a balloon expandable in this particular case? For example, yeah. the Sabian 20 yeah, yeah. millimeter valve could yeah. be used in this case with good the engagement of the coronary in the future, although yeah. it's, it's a T1, maybe yeah. she will never need that. Yeah. Uh, what, is, what, what was the I reason you decided? Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And a balloon expandable as a first case will seem to be more, a little bit, uh, uh, a reasonable choice. However, we have more experience with this platform as a team, so we chose the platform. I think so it's very... So the results of the SMART trial recently, yeah. this valve is ideal because yeah, yeah. you have a better hemodynamic yeah, yeah. Uh, profi profile yeah, and yeah. Uh, the gradients will be lower, the aortic valve area will be... Uh, exactly, but of course they were not, no, I think, in TAV. In TAV it was in... Uh, uh, the SMART trial was in... Uh, uh, was for small annulus, you mean, but not in in uh, an annulus caused by generative valve, in, uh, valve already put in the place. So, of course, if we can, uh, we can do it. Okay. And also the coroners that were okay was another reason why the balloon expandable that has shorter yeah. frame and shorter valve, okay, it was a second choice. Sure. Um, just uh, in order to close the case, if there is no other comment, there is only a small uh, paravalvular leak of uh, the second valve uh, implanted. Also the gradient was two, uh, 16 millimeters and uh, 2.5 the um, the uh, aortic valve uh, speed also. And uh, just a few words uh, in order to say that, as we know, there are a few different types for um, biprosthetic uh, aortic valve dysfunction. In our case, it was a structural valve dysfunction. And as we know, the mortality, even if we are doing a TAVI in TAVI and not all, a biprosthetic valve that is surgically impl implanted, we know that uh, there is a better mortality rate than in, in cases that we decide to exclude, to, um, I'm sorry, um, to expand the TAVI. And also, as far as uh, the choice of the valve that you already have mentioned, we do know that uh, there is a, better, uh, a larger effective orifice area in case of a, a self-expandable valve, but the balloon um, expandables have a lower rate of um, dysfunction of the valve type 1 dysfunction. Uh, we already mentioned uh, uh, the, the VTA and uh, the risk plane that it was okay. Uh, the Basilica, is, you already mentioned that uh, we did not need to do that, but we were prepared if something went wrong that we might need to protect the coronaries as well. And we remember the general rules in case of TAV in TAV that a balloon in balloon expandable, same size, but uh, balloon in self we downgrade the size a little bit. Uh, just uh, as far as bibliography is concerned, uh, the, the registry of explant or radio tower showed that um, the, the tower explant was uh, done quicker than the tower in tower, but better results long term. And as far as our choices uh, are concerned, we need to know, of course, the patient and his anatomy quite well. Also, if we have the right measurements, as far as the CT is concerned, uh, it's the optimal for our preparation for uh, the procedure. And also, uh, be ready for everything that goes wrong, even, even if it's uh, the, the valve itself or maybe also uh, the arteries of the feet. Uh, just a few words. Uh, recently, 
uh, Dr. Dimitriadis, uh, Professor Chiu, also uh, and myself, we had a meta-analysis uh, including 17,000 patients that uh, we showed, we, oh, I'm sorry, we compared TAVI in TAVI or redo in several patients. Uh, we saw that uh, the intervention was also was the only fact that favors redo several and valve involved in case of transcatheter valves was better as far as new pacemaker implantation was needed, the stroke at 30 days and the MIR 30 days, and also, of course, the hospitalization that was fewer days. The only, uh, the only points that were better in uh, case of surgical uh, valve was uh, the mid-gradient after the valve, as we saw in the beginning, also the paravalvular leak. And uh, in conclusion, I would like to I point out the fact that uh, with uh, Professor Tufis and uh, his, um, his will, we started a registry in our hospital that includes all uh, Greek hospitals, of course, for everyone who would like to participate in patients with symptomatic severe dysfunction of um, a biprosthetic valve implanted. And the primary points are all cause and cardiovascular mortality and ischemic composites. So, Given the fact that the number of patients who need valve and valve procedures will increase due to uh, the longer life expectancy nowadays, we need to say that uh, we need to know the anatomical factors as well as uh, meticulously uh, have uh, the data from the CT scan and also know the, the valve that we are going to implant in order to better position and size and to avoid all the major problems that may come in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me take the opportunity, since there are so many prominent surgeons and interventional operators in the audience, and ask a very simple clinical cardiologist question, but it may be complex also. What would be the valve of choice for a younger patient, 60 year old, who will need, let's say, for bicuspid aortic valve, valve replacement at the age of 60. Would it be a surgical valve? Would it be an interventional procedure? There is a chance that such a young patient may need to redo procedures in his lifetime. How do you approach this? We are all relieved by the success, the immediate success of whichever procedure. But how can we see it in the future? What is the best investment for the patient? Any thoughts? I would invite any thoughts. Nineteen valve or a twenty-one valve. In my operating room, the, the rule is no no woman leaves with less than twenty-three, no man leaves with less than twenty-five. So if your surgeon's putting in nineteen and twenty-ones, you probably just do a tab or get a new surgeon. Uh, but I think for somebody sixty, you know they need it. They need a, a, a if they want a biologic valve, mechanical valve is fine too. But if they want a biologic valve, pericardial. Don't use porcine in aorta. They always have more obstructive flow, and they also fail by AI, which is a quick failure and make sure your surgeon puts in a reasonable valve. If you come out with a 25 or 27 valve, not only is it going to last longer, but when it comes back to the cardiologist, you are now a better setup for a, a valve and valve. But 19, you, you should never, you, that's sad. Well, I mean, for the bicuspid uh, scenario you presented, clearly the surgery would be the first choice. Uh, the more tricky part is, though, uh, becomes really interesting what's happening with that per same exact patient who's going to go for surgery and the aortic size is 4.1 or 4.2, very common sizes. And, uh, you know, how do, how do we deal with that? Is okay to go for surgery and not replace a ascending aorta? You're replacing the ascending aorta? Um, that is always a, a tricky one. Uh, and uh, I don't think we know enough about that. I would uh, welcome any uh, research advices also over the time about this thing because there may be some biomarkers over the we're gonna have to find 
to, to indicate where, who are the people who are prone to develop a future dilation of the auric arch versus of the ascending order versus not. I know Dr. Riordan and I see Professor Chuf is also joined. Perhaps he will weigh in as well. Well, the, well, they are developing biomarkers, but we're not going to do genetic biomarkers on everybody. It's just not going to happen. And 4.5 is the guidelines. But again, you know, it depends on if you're a six foot eight man or a, you know a four foot ten woman. What 4.1 really means. And, and at 4.1, there's not a, a lot of chance it's going to do it. And on another side of that coin, I'm actually running a type A and an ascending aorta stent graft trial. Five years from now, we may have a stent graft for this too. I mean, there are things coming down the pike. But at 4.1, unless it's a really tiny person, I'd have a hard time replacing that. Or, or remember, all phenotypes are different. Type zero with AI, those will progress. Type one, they stay stable. Professor Chufis maybe has a comment, and thank you for connecting. Uh... Yeah. Being able to connect it uh, earlier due to another uh, commitment in a meeting in Krakow in uh, Poland. Uh, so oh, I did uh, attend the session, so just uh, to thank you all and please go ahead with your comments. I think, I think we're ready to conclude this case. Thank you for your presentation. It was very nice and elegant presentation of a valve and valve case with all the aspects of this. Uh, um, Thank you, Professor Jufis. We have to move to, to Anasis Cartax, uh, Cartax Surgery Center and Dr. Yagovu.